Um, I'm going to put that link in the chat, and so you can have access to it um, this whole time. And another way to access it, if you don't, for some reason, if you lose the chat, uh, lose the the URL, you can just go to Northshire.com and follow the uh, button for notes from the Shire. Um, another quick note before we get started, we are recording this evening's presentation for future broadcasts on our YouTube channel, um, but fear not, only those of us who are unmuted and speaking will be recorded, so you are not recorded for posterity, um, but please do stay muted and use the chat throughout the evening if you have comments or questions um, at any point. Uh, you can go ahead and use that at any point. Um, and then last of all, before we get started, a note of thanks to all of you, our loyal customers and friends. Um, it's been a long year, it's been a hard year. Um, we're still here, able to do stuff like this, and the fact that we're still here is really thanks to all of you. Um, we could not do this, we couldn't, we would not still have our doors open in both stores um, without mm. your incredible support. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and we're very grateful to all of you for being here tonight. And now David is going to take things away. All right, um, well, this is uh, of course one of our most popular events the uh, publisher uh, sales rep book picks night and uh, first off it's our rep from penguin books uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce carl krueger carl uh, tell us hello about books good evening nice to see all of you it's always fun to talk about books um, i picked out some of my favorites and um, i'm going to start with the authenticity project which hopefully you can see there's a little bit of sunlight coming through there um, it's by claire pooley and it's now available in paperback. It was a bestseller in hardcover. She was a great discovery, really sweet author to work with. So that I always like to champion her book. Um, Six Strangers, One Green Notebook, A Coffee Shop, and tales in those notebooks ensue. It's left around the city of London and people are encouraged to write their stories in there and questions of, would you tell the truth in the book? Would you make something else up? Um, one of the characters has what I'd like to call a fake Instagram life. You know those people whose lives look absolutely perfect on Instagram? And then you find out behind the scenes. Um, it's just a lot of fun. It's a great escape reading. Um, and it deals, it also, de one of the things I really loved about it is that it deals with loneliness. And so it's very timely. And it also deals with elders being alone, who, you know, elderly people who live alone and who takes care of them in their neighborhood and in their circle. So that's a, a favorite again, um, the Authenticity Project, Claire Pooley. And then one of my favorite things to do, especially at Northshire with the retired Sarah Knight um, and um, Sarah Donner is um, discover thriller writers. So this guy just popped up on my radar. He's a first timer, it's called Fire Watching and his name is Russ Thomas. And he's a Brit who did many different things and then finally became a bookseller and decided that that was making him so happy that he taught himself to become a writer. And I just wanna share, it says for mom who never once told me to get a proper job. So I love that opening. So Fire Watching is your police procedural thriller set in Yorkshire, one of my favorite places in the world. Um, you've got a gay detective. His partner is a Muslim woman. They live in a small town where they're both considered outsiders. There's a missing stranger, an abandoned mansion. There are bodies literally buried in the attic, um, but I'm not gonna give away much more than that. Hopefully he's gonna make this character into a series and you're gonna see a lot more of these. So again, fire watching. Um, up next on sale today, some of you might know her from The Hunger or The Deep. Um, it's called Red Widow. So Alma Katsu um, was at one point a FBI um, employee. She was an agent and she got really frustrated with reading all the male thrillers. She didn't like how the female characters were being portrayed and how they were treated either by their superiors or their colleagues. So she decided I'll write my own. So she did. And reminds me a lot of, oh, a little bit of Anne Cleves and, uh, and actually a little bit of Tana French, believe it or not. There's a little bit of that in there. Um, so this is, um, like I say, on sale today, um, big, you know, fun behind the scenes from someone who really knows what she's talking about because that was her life before she became an author. And up, then we have, you guys may have seen this one already. It's called the Thursday Murder Club and his name is Richard Osman. 
Yeah, did you like it? And in the UK, he's a really big TV personality. Unfortunately, we couldn't bring him over here because of COVID, you know, to have him do all the media. But the good news is he's written a new book, which is coming in the fall, and it's called The Man Who Died Twice. This one is for people who live in a really nice little retirement community and everyone's peaceful and happy. And what they like to do is they meet in the jigsaw puzzle room on Thursday nights and try to solve unsolved murders. But then wouldn't you know, a local detective, I'm sorry, a local developer turns up murdered. So the four of them have their very first case to solve live. And it's funny and smart and dark and just all the things that you would want in there. Um, again, Thursday Murder Club, Richard Osman. Um, and then I have Superhost by Kate Russo. You might know her, that <clears throat> her father is Richard Russo, the writer. So this one <clears throat> takes place again, we're back in England. Um, Kate actually lived in England for quite a while. In fact, I think she's back there now. So it's about an artist who at one time was really famous and his work sold for a lot of money. And somehow he started to fade and he's told at one point, well, your, your work will be worth more when you're dead. So he lives in a large townhouse in London and he decides to rent it out because he's low on funds. And so he becomes an Airbnb host. And it's what happens when these three women, well, two women actually end up moving in somewhat permanently. And it's all about the relationships between the three of them, um, relationships in middle age, um, longing for a long-term relationship from one of the women in particular. Um, but I just love it because again, smart and um, if you just embrace these characters, they're, they're all so well-written. So, and um, lots of good anecdotes about Airbnb and you know the, the thing, the stories that happen behind the scenes. And so super host, um, Kate Russo. And then I know it's the, let's see, it's third day of spring, but <clears throat> this little book is called Wintering and her name is Catherine May. And this is a book about <clears throat> dealing with what we've been dealing with. And this was written long before COVID, but it's only, re well, it came out in the fall. Um, I was immediately reminded of Kate Braystrup. She wrote a book called Here If You Need Me, one of my favorite books of all time. And it's coping with really difficult life situations, death, loss, loneliness, <clears throat> but it's not, um, she doesn't leave you feeling hopeless. It's not a downer kind of book. I don't even like that word, but it, it, it lifts you up and it actually goes month by month and it ends in March. So it's the seasons changing and how you embrace them <clears throat> and how you live in those seasons, which is really good. Um, so wintering, and it's um, also if you're an Elizabeth Gilbert fan, I, I would say that would be you know the other more contemporary uh, person to compare her to. <clears throat> Sorry, let me get some water. Mm. And then lastly, um, a gothic thriller. So an abandoned sanatorium in the Swiss Alps. Um, this is called The Sanatorium. Um, this has been out for a few weeks now. This has just hit bestseller list. So this, this uh, sanatorium has been turned into a high-end minimalist hotel. And this woman, she's a retired detective and she has this brother that she hasn't heard from in years. He gets engaged and the brother invites her to come to the engagement party at the hotel and things go very wrong. Two people go missing the very next morning. Um, there's a massive blizzard. People can't get out. All the roads are closed. Um, so I, again, I love that kind of, you know, who's behind this door, who's down this hallway, um, is, is this character telling you the truth? So um, again, the sanatorium by Sarah Pierce, uh, P-E-A-R-S-E. -E. So I hope you enjoy them. And if you have questions, just let me know. And thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. What a, a great list. And I know that I saw lots of pins writing furiously oh, there <laughs> in the audience. Um, all right, well, next up uh, from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, Katie McGarry, tell us what you recommend. Oh, well, I, actually, I was very busy writing Carl's titles down too. So um, yeah. Uh, so hello, I'm, I'm Katie McGarry from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. And just uh, give me a second, I'm going to uh, share my screen here. But uh, before I do, I just wanted to mention quickly, since it's only two days away, um, Tolkien Reading Day is March 25th. It's a big holiday in the book world. Well, 
my, my book world anyway. And um, why March 25th? It marks the day when the ring was destroyed and completed Frodo's quest, vanquished Sauron. And every year on this day, fans around the world celebrate and promote the work of Tolkien by reading favorite passages and stories. So even though it's not on the list that I sent through, dust off your copy of The Hobbit, pick up a new up set for the Lord of the Rings trilogy and start reading because you know, they're awesome books and uh, it's a really fun thing to celebrate. All right, here comes the technical part of the program. Okay, does it work, Devin? Is it, is it, let's see, there we go. Is it sharing? Yep. Okay, awesome, thank you. Hang on one sec here. Okay. Oops. Sorry. So let's see, hold on, I need to click. There we go. Um, my first title mm -hmm. is Extraterrestrial by Avi Loeb. He's Harvard's top astronomer, and he lays out his controversial theory that our solar system was recently visited by advanced alien technology from a distant star. In late, wait a sec, hold on. I'm just gonna turn off my video. There you go. In late uh, 2017, scientists at a Hawaiian observatory glimpsed an object soaring through that our inner solar system and they named it Oumuamua. It was moving so quickly that it only could have come from another star. It was not an asteroid. It was moving too fast along a strange orbit and it left no trail of gas or debris. There was only one conceivable explanation. It was a piece of advanced technology created by a distant alien civilization. An extraterrestrial Loeb takes readers on the inside thrilling story of the first interstellar visitor to be spotted in our solar system. He outlines his controversial theory and its profound implications for science, for religion, and the future of our species and planet. This challenges readers to aim for the stars and to think critically about what's out there, no matter how strange it seems. When this book was published in January, it hit the bestseller list and it's still selling pretty well. The story of humankind is told as one of technological innovation and economic influence of arrowheads and atom bombs, settlers and stock markets. But behind it all, there's an even more fundamental driver, food. In Animal Vegetable dunk, Junk, number one New York Times bestselling author and trusted food authority, Mark Bittman offers a panoramic view of how the frenzy for food has driven human history to some of its most catastrophic moments from slavery and colonialism to famine and genocide into our current moment where big food exacerbates climate change, plunders our planet and sickens its people. But Bittman refuses to concede that the battle is lost. He talks about activists, workers and governments who around the world are choosing well-being over corporate greed and gluttony and fighting to free society from big food's grip. This debut story collection by Taiping Chen has been called Immensely Rewarding from the First Sentence to the Last by Charles Yu. Oops, oh no. Oh, sorry, sorry. And a stirring and brilliant love letter and sharp social criticism. It's clear eyed realism and tongue in cheek magical realism. Chen's stories coalesce into a portrait of people striving for openings where mobility is limited. Twins take a radically different path. One becomes a professional gambler, the other a political activist. A woman moves to the city to work at a government call center, followed by her violent ex-boyfriend. A man is swept into a high risk, high reward temptation of China's volatile stock exchange. And this story was my favorite. A group of people sit trapped for no reason on a subway platform for months, just waiting for official permission to leave. It's gripping and compassionate. The land of big numbers traces the journeys of diverse and legion Chinese people, their history, their government, and how all that has tumbled messily, violently, but still beautifully into the present. I am a huge fan of Ellie Griffiths. This mm. is the follow-up to her Edgar Award-winning book, The Stranger Diaries. The Washington Post called it a droll romp and a latter-day Miss Marple. 
the death of a 90-year-old woman with a heart condition should not be suspicious. And Detective Sergeant Harbinder Carr can certainly see nothing out of the ordinary when Peggy's caretaker, Natalka, begins to recount Peggy Smith's passing. But Natalka had reason to be at the police station. While clearing out Peggy's flat, she noticed an unusual number of crime novels, all dedicated to Peggy. And each psychological thriller included a mysterious postscript, P.S. for P.S. When a gunman breaks into the flat to steal a book and the author is found dead, Detective Cower begins to think that perhaps there's no such thing as an unsuspicious death after all. And then things escalate. From an Aberdeen literary festival to the streets of Edinburgh, writers are being targeted. D.S. Carr embarks upon a road trip across Europe and reckons with exactly how authors think up such realistic crimes. Ellie Griffiths is also the author of the Ruth Galloway mystery series. And if you like Louise Penny and are looking for a new series, may I suggest giving them a try. Uh, so I have a bunch of Vermont authors on this list. And this is the first one. Uh, Julia Cook lives um, uh, sort of down in the Queechy area. And uh, this is a first time look at the daring and unexpected lives of jet age stewardesses during the seismic decade, the mid 60s to the mid 70s. These were women who came from cities and small towns across America, and they chose to work for Pan Am because it was the country's only exclusive international carrier. These young women wanted out and they wanted up into the air. Come Fly With Me tells the story of the special sort of young woman attracted to the job during this era of commercial flight. She had to have a college degree. She had to speak two languages and possess the political savvy and internationalism of a foreign service officer. She had to know how to cook eggs in flight so they didn't turn green and how to make a dry martini at 30,000 feet. She could open the door of a 747 in the unlikely event that it was upside down and underwater. All that, and she had to be between five foot three and five foot nine, 105 and 140 pounds, and no older than 26. Julia's intimate storytelling weaves together the real life trajectories of this memorable cast of characters, small town girls, big city girls, and the relatively few African-American stewardesses of the era. This is fantastic and very readable women's history. I was caught up. Plunder is Menachem Kaiser's brilliantly told story woven from improbable events which are set in motion when the author takes up his Holocaust survivor grandfather's former battle to reclaim the family's apartment building in Poland. Soon he's on a circuitous path to encounters with the longtime residents of the building with the help of a Polish lawyer known as the killer. A surprise discovery that his grandfather's cousin not only survived the war, but wrote a secret memoir while a slave laborer in a vast secret Nazi tunnel complex leads Menachem to being adopted as a virtual celebrity by a band of Silesian treasure seekers who revere the memoir as an indispensable guidebook to Nazi plunder. What does it mean to seize your own legacy? Can reclaimed property repair rifts among the living? Plunder is deeply immersive adventure story and an irreverent daring interrogation of inheritance. It just, it reads, it reads like a thriller. It was really, really fun. The Arsonist City is Hala Island's second novel and follows one family, the Azars, over the course of a summer as they fight over whether or not to sell their ancestral home in Beirut, which is their last tie to the region. Throughout this novel, Island shows us Beirut as a city of ignition, literally and figuratively. Decades of turmoil have left it exposed and smoldering, a sensation amplified by the Lebanese tradition of arson as a form of political protest. In the face of that volatility, the tension lying barely beneath the surface, the Azar family lights up, forcing them to contend with issues that trouble them most. And quite often it's the secrets that they want to keep from each other. There's a rich set of characters here for readers to sink into. There are all kinds of important issues, immigration, cultural tension, religious differences, sexual orientation, extramarital affairs, and more. It'd be a great book group book. Um, it's, it's really thick and juicy. There's just so much in here. It's hard to get it all in. Uh, Tiger Girl and the Candy Kid by Glenn Stout. Uh, he also lives in Vermont. 
tells the true jazz age tale of America's first gangster couple, not Bonnie and Clyde, but Margaret and Richard Whittemore. In the wake of world war, pandemic and economic depression, these two love struck kids from working class Baltimore reached for the dream of a better life. They headed up a gang that in less than a year stole over a million dollars worth of diamonds and precious gems, which would be about $10 million today. Margaret was a flapper, Richard was a bad boy whose cunning and violent ambition allowed them to live the kind of lives that they'd only seen in the movies. He killed three people along the way until prosecutors managed a conviction and then tabloids across the country exclaimed the details of the couple's star-crossed romance and they became heroes to a new generation of young Americans. This is set against the backdrop of the Roaring Twenties and it's a thrilling tale of rags to riches tragedy and infamy. And then here's another Vermonter, um, Alison Bechdel's Secret to Human Strength. Uh, she is a comic and cultural superstar, and this is a poignant and profound graphic novel of her love affair with exertion set against the chronicle of the fitness fads of our times. She started her fascination with ex exercise when she was eight, and she wrote away for um, a brochure that she saw advertised on a cereal box called The Secret to Superhuman Strength. This book moves from decade to decade and you see her never ending program for self-improvement. And it also really illuminates some of the high and low points of our own shared obsessions with bodily health, beginning with a very young Allison watching health guru to housewives, Jack LaLanne on TV in the 60s. He's fascinated by the pronounced gender bending. The thought bubble reads that outlandish jumpsuit fills biceps like cantaloupes. Jane Fonda shows up in the 80s with her big leg warmers. And then we move on to feminist karate dojos, nautilus, rollerblading, body fat analysis, yoga, and then of course, spin class. Finally, the facing the body's inevitable downward trajectory in chapter six, which is Allison's 50s, she comes to a soulful conclusion. She hasn't developed six pack abs, but she's closer to the secret of human strength. And for Allison, it's the acceptance of vulnerability, interdependence, and an openness to the mysterious interplay of nature, mind, and spirit. So Brian Broom, I need you to remember the name Brian Broom. This book, Punch Me Up to the Gods, will be coming out on May 18th, and it's the sales rep's in-house favorite across the whole company. It's a memoir about growing up in Ohio as a dark-skinned Black gay boy and a teenager in the 70s and 80s, trying to be a man when everything that Brian did and represented struggled to fit the stereotypical characteristics for Black malehood. He was a perpetual outsider and the people around him, parents, teachers, siblings, friend, try to squeeze him into something to make a man of him. It's devastating to take in when you think about what he must have been feeling as a boy. It's, it's an accessible book. It's not like homework. Um, some parts I had to read through my fingers because his adolescence and young adulthood were tough, but more than anything, you'll be rooting for him. And as a reading experience, it, it was totally amazing. I, I can't recommend it highly enough. 2021 is the 100th anniversary of the Appalachian Trail, and we're publishing a history of the AT, a biography of the AT. It's America's most beloved trek with millions of hikers setting foot on it every year. And few people are aware of the fascinating backstory of the dreamers and builders who helped bring it to life. There's Grandma Gatewood, a mother of 11 who threw hiked in canvas sneakers on a drawstring duffel, and Bill Bryson, the author of the best-selling Walk Through the Woods, who seized American imagination like no one else. It's a 2000 mile long hike from Georgia to Maine. It's not just a trail through the woods, but a set of ideas about nature etched into the forest floor. This is a terrific book, not just for hikers, but for anyone who wonders about our relationship with the outdoors and dreams about getting away from urban life and for a pilgrimage out in the wild. The Conductors is a paperback original and introduces readers to Hetty Rhodes, a magic user and free woman of color and former conductor on the Underground Railroad. She's living in post-Civil War Philadelphia with her husband. 
And when violence or crimes occur within the community of free former slaves or free people of color, the residents don't turn to white authorities who would be threatening to them. They come to Hetty Rose and her husband, Benji. It's a paranormal fantasy meets historical mystery. And certainly, um, you know, a young adult reader would find this interesting too. Uh, Rebel Cinderella by Adam Hochschild is an astonishing and forgotten story of an immigrant sweatshop worker who became one of the most charismatic radical leaders of her time. Rose Pastor came to New York in 1903. She was a Jewish refugee from Russia. And two years later, she was in the headlines when she married James Graham Philip Stokes, a scion of New York society. Together, they moved among the socialist activists and dreamers in this country, including Emma Goldman, Eugene Debs, Margaret Sanger, and W.E.B. Dubois. She you know, led labor strikes, distributed birth control, and Woodrow Wilson called her one of the most dangerous influences of the country. And then I just have to tell you that uh, my very favorite book of last year will be in paperback in April, Becoming Duchess Goldblatt. This book is almost two stories, that of a reclusive real life writer who created a fictional character because she was lonely and out of thin air, and that of the magical Duchess Goldblatt herself, a bright light in the darkness of social media. Fans around the world are drawn to her grace's voice, her wit, her life affirming love for all humanity and the fun and friendship of the community that's strung up around her. This touching memoir will change you and help bring us all to a happier place in the quirky world of social media. It's a charmer. So then I have some kids books to talk about quickly. Uh, wow in the world, the how and the wow of the human body is currently on the New York Times bestseller list. It's the number one kids rated podcast and it's been downloaded more than a hundred times. And complex science is broken down in a fun, hilarious and accessible way. And we've tried to translate that into a book. It's not an encyclopedia about the human body. It's not just a compendium of information. It's really interactive. It's filled with quizzes, prompts, comics, activities, and it's meant for a kid to flip open to any page and be immediately engaged. There are comics about earwax, a Venn diagram of poop, an in-depth interview between Mindy and her lungs, and a recipe for bones. There's stuff on every page. It's, it's really very fun for all kinds of ages. And I think parents would enjoy it too. Um, here's an unlikely friendship, Sydney and Taylor. Sydney is a skunk and Taylor is a hedgehog, but no matter how odd the pairing may seem, they're friends naturally. They live in a cozy burrow until one day Taylor gets a big idea to go see the whole wide world from mountains taller than a hundred hedgehogs and valleys wider than a thousand skunks to all the dangers that lie in the human world. Sydney and Taylor want to see it all. With a map and a dream, they set off and discover that the world is much bigger than they realize. Their full color illustrations and a really laugh out loud story make this a perfect chapter book to share or begin a reading journey of your own. Uh, Dana Lorenz is from the Burlington area and she works as a clerk in the Vermont family courts. She's written a moving and poignant story told in alternating perspectives about a down on her luck girl who rescues a baby owl and how the two set each other free. Rufus is a great horned owl who at eight months old can't hunt and his mother is hit by a car and he discovers just how dangerous the forest can be for a little owlet on his own. Rini has given up on adults and learned how to care for herself, which is a good thing. She's been sent to live with an aunt she's never met, but this aunt is a falconer who agrees to help Rini catch the injured owl and rehabilitate it. And when Rini catches Rufus, his eyes lock on her heart and they form a powerful friendship. But can he learn to trust in the outside and fly free? And can Rini open her heart enough to truly soar? It's just a lovely, lovely friendship book. Um, really sweet, full of lots of great nature imagery. And then for something completely different, um, Training Day and Tag Team are two early readers in the El Toro and Friends series by Raul III, which is spinning off from the world of Vamos. El Toro is a lucador, a masked Mexican wrestler. His friends include a rooster named Kuki Duki, La Oink Oink, his wrestling partner, and The Wall, his arch rival, and an assortment of fellow wrestlers. 
In tag team, El Toro has to clean up the wrestling coliseum after a big match and he's overwhelmed. But La Oink Oink comes to his rescue and shows him that if they work together, like when they tag team, when they wrestle, they'll be able to get everything done. You see scenes of them plunging toilets, mopping floors and chasing chickens. In training day, El Toro has a big match coming up against the champion, the wall. But like many of us, he's having a hard time getting out of bed. Enter his personal trainer, Kooky Dooky, who has all kinds of great ideas to get him into shape, chasing chickens to keep him quick on his feet, crushing cars into cubes to strengthen his arms, and my favorite, helping grandmothers across the street to learn patience. With the support of his love and love of his fans cheering him on like in any good Rocky movie, El Toro finishes his training and takes on the wall. These books are fabulous with their sweet messages and laugh out loud humor. Raul is a great talent. His books don't look like anything else out there and his artwork is electrifying and joyous. And then um, I am, I may have gray hair, but I am a 14 year old reader at heart. And uh, this is just one of my favorites. Um, it, Lynette Noni is Australia's number one YA author. And uh, this is her first book in the US. It's a fast paced thrill ride in the dangerous world of a prison camp. Um, and Kiva knows that she's the main character in this labor camp that she's lived in since she was seven years old. She's the prison's healer and she has to treat everyone, murderers, rebels, and the falsely accused. And the only way she can stay alive is to stay neutral. But when the queen of the rebels is brought to the prison on her deathbed with a secret message from Kiva's family, it says, keep her alive, we're coming. And suddenly Kiva has hope and she'll do anything to see the outside world and her family again. And so there's a plague sweeping Zalimdov the prison, a mysterious new inmate fighting for Kiva's heart and a prison rebellion brewing. And she can't escape, escape the feeling that her trials have just begun. There's a slow burning romance, the kind that keeps you turning the pages. I couldn't put it down. And this book kept me reading under the covers with a flashlight. So I thought they were just fantastic. Um, I liked them very much. And uh, thank you very much for listening. These are my choices for spring and summer. Thank you so much, Katie. That was fantastic. I'm going to stop your sharing. All right. And uh, next up, we have Stacy Williams from Ingram Publisher Services. Uh, please tell us some of your recommendations. Hey, um, I'm a former bookseller, and so um, I talk like one. So if you're like, wow, it sounds like she's trying to sell me on this book as if I'm standing in the store with her, it's true. <laughs> um, uh, can't, can't take the bookseller out of the girl. Um, so I have the privilege of getting to talk about books that you very likely have never heard of from publishers you are not familiar with. Um, I work with a lot of small presses and niche presses who do you know, great work, but they don't generally hit the bestseller list. So you're kind of like, oh, how do I find them? Well, because either someone puts it in your hand, you stumble upon it on a shelf, it's that kind of experience. Um, and that also means that I have books that perhaps came out in the latter part of last year that uh, didn't get a, a chance to find a reader because of, well, you know, everything. So um, I'll, I'll hopefully be able to uh, put some of those into your hands as well. But the first book up actually um, is not really one of those at all, but a book that just came out this month called Bake from Scratch. And this is actually the fifth volume in an annual anthology that collects all of the recipes from the previous year of the editions of a magazine called Bake from Scratch magazine. Um, they are now going into their sixth year of existence. They're really, really cool. I actually get their magazine. They send me like little tchotchkes and stuff whenever they send me a book. It's really great. But this is huge. I mean, this is so many recipes. Every single recipe has photos, every single one of them. Yeah, and it's all different kinds of baking, big, little, sweet, savory, you know, just everything, everything. Everything has been kitchen tested. Um, their Instagram is just, will just make you drool. So, you know, you can check that out. I think it's just bake feed is what it's called. You know, there's stuff about just basic techniques for certain things. So anyway, just a quick little, plug for those of you who either just picked up baking and want to get better or those of you who always have and just want more. So that's a good one. Um, on the kind of literary side of things, um, 
I have one of my favorite books from last year um, across any publisher that I read is this book called Seven by Farzana Doctor. Um, Farzana is a Lambda Literary Award winner uh, from 2012. Um, her previous book was also shortlisted for the Toronto Book Award and the CBC, which is the Canadian Broadcasting Company, uh, named her one of 10 Canadian women writers you need to read now. That already sounds impressive, right? Well, this book came out last year in the fall and it was chosen by the, Can the Canadian Broadcasting Company as one of their, um, as sorry, the best Canadian fiction book of 2020. Um, it was an Indigo, which is a chain of um, kind of mid-sized bookstores in Canada. Um, they chose it as one of their top 50 books of 2020. It was an Amnesty International Book Club pick voted by readers over Margaret Atwood. Um, it got rave reviews from the Globe and Mail, Toronto Star, Quill and Choir. This is, I, the equivalent of this in the US would be just about any literary book you could think of off the top of your head. Um, but it's Canadian. So have you heard about it? Probably not. Um, perfect for book clubs. It's about um, a woman named Sharifa who goes back home to India uh, with her husband, who's going to spend a year there teaching as a professor. They've been living in New York since she was very, very young, like college student young when she left home to, to try to make a life somewhere else. And when she goes back, she starts to do research into um, her great grandfather, great great grandfather, who was one of the founders of a Shia sect of Islam called the Bora. And so she she learns about how this this ancestor of hers um, did a lot to try to um, equalize some of the gender rights and gender roles and and norms of his time. But of course, those are very, very different and still quite a bit behind where we are today. Um, one of the things though, that she, she goes home and as she's learning about all of these things, she's also getting to know her uh, cousins again. She has a sister who is very conservative, um, still practices the religion. Uh, she has another sister who has completely put the religion aside. Um, she runs her own publishing company. She's unmarried, she smokes pot, all of those things. And so these three cousins start spending time together. And Sharifa, who's been having some marital problems, starts to learn about a tradition in her community that had always been kept a secret uh, because her one of her cousins starts to talk about it and that's female genital mutilation um, cutting, which happens uh, when girls are seven years old in that um, culture. Um, so she starts to learn about that and that weaves its way in until it becomes a greater portion of the story. Um, her own seven-year-old daughter is with her in India. She begins to have to you know, worry about whether or not uh, a relative is going to take her own daughter to have that done to her. Um, it is just an absolutely wonderful book. Um, it's gorgeously written. I, I could not put it down when I read it. I just kept returning to it. There's so much to talk about in terms of gender roles and culture and religion just beliefs and um, why some things that sound terrible still exist in the world. Um, and one of the things she says in here that I really appreciate was she talks about how the women, even though all of this seems patriarchal, it's the women who continue to make this stuff um, a regular occurrence within their tradition. So it's a little heartbreaking too, but truly I, I cannot recommend this enough, especially for book clubs. And she's available to meet with book clubs. Um, another favorite book of last year is He Came In With It. Um, this is by Miriam Feldman. This came out in hardcover uh, last fall and is coming out in paperback this summer. It is also available on Libro FM right now as an audiobook. And um, you've probably heard of Robert Kolker's book, Hidden Valley Road, which is about a family of seven boys who all had schizophrenia and what that experience was like for that family. That is an extreme situation. That is an extraordinary sort of experience. Um, this is an intimate experience. Uh, Miriam's son was diagnosed with schizophrenia about 10 years after he started showing signs. Um, she talks about, you know, um, very compellingly what it's like to be a mother to somebody who has schizophrenia, what that experience is like for him, um, his, his lived experience. She has to worry about being a parent to her uh, two daughters that are much younger and how to keep them safe um, when he goes through some violent phases. How does she make sure that he takes his medication? How does she fight a mental health care system that is so broken that she can't even get enough care for him on a regular basis? Um, until the Affordable Care Act happened and she was able to suddenly access more care for him. Um, 
she she does the parenting questioning of what did I do wrong, but not in a way that makes her a victim in any way. She's hopeful. She loves her son deeply and wants the best for him. And um, despite all of that, that hard stuff, um, it's a beautiful memoir and it ends on a really hopeful note. Um, so if you read Hidden Valley Road and you want to know what the kind of real personal experience is of that, of that sort of struggle, then um, he came in with it. Um, in much brighter news, uh, this book, Finding Rhythm, just came out Ta -da, by Eleanor Salmon. Um, and uh, it's about a woman who was a happiness researcher, rising a star in her career. Um, and one day somebody asked her what made her happy. And she realized that she didn't think anything did. She didn't know what that was anymore. And she writes in the very, very opening page um, of her book, something that I think we all can relate to these days. Uh, she writes, a series of sad events had left me with a broken heart, the first signs of burnout and a cloudy mind, making it difficult for me to think or see clearly. I desperately want to break from work to learn something new, even if for just a few months, I want to liberate my body. But my achievements have come with a growing workload and a flooded inbox, leaving me with a little space to quietly refre reflect on my creative outlets and countless ideas. It dawns on me that I am much more than my profession. So what does she do? She decides that she is going to take a year off work and she is going to travel around the world, um, uh, this half of our hemisphere, uh, North America and Latin America. And she's going to learn eight dances um, in one year. And she's going to learn it for the sake of learning, not for the sake of mastery, not for the sake of being an expert or a champion or anything like that. Um, she ends up learning 18 in a year and a half because of course things don't always go the way we think they will, um, especially when we're open and curious and uh, learning for the sake of learning does that for one. Um, kind of like the Bechtel secret to human strength, like a lot of that sort of connecting with your body, knowing what it's capable of, connecting with others, it's all wonderful. Um, but there's also so much in here about dance, the history of lots of Latin American dances. Um, she talks to a lot of folks who are legends. Uh, she learns about the cultures that created the dances. So she learns not just the how of them, but the why, the what, the where, the when, all of that. So if you need like an eat, pray, love situation, but jubilant and uh, with travel and dance, then this one's for you. Um, next up is a book uh, called The Burn Book. This is from a, a small press called Dalkey, who is most well known for publishing uh, literature and translation and world, world lit. Um, this particular book is by an American writer who's sort of been lost to history in large part um, because he's Black. Um, he was born in 1924 in Missouri. Um, he worked on a railroad. He served in World War II, including being at the uh, liberation of Paris. Um, he tried to go to college, didn't quite work out. He went home, did not feel like he was welcome in his own country. Um, lots of changes in Kansas City were happening to his family and to his neighborhoods. Um, so he decided to go back to Paris. Uh, that's where uh, James Baldwin and Richard Wright and you know a whole host of expats had gone to go become writers. And he thought, ah, that's what I need to do to go become an artist. So he goes there, realizes he kind of hates it, and finds his way to Switzerland to burn to the city way up in the Alps. Um, and so this book covers four years of his first four years of being in Bern. Um, he, he writes um, in two different styles. One is sort of a, a recounting of conversations that he's had at dinner parties or in music clubs. Um, and he's a natural born storyteller. So you really feel like you were at the table listening to these guests ask him questions and hear him talk about his life story. Um, because of course, he's not only the only black person in the city of Bern, um, he's also the first black person that many, many, many people have met. Uh, and so he has to navigate that along with his desires to really become a part of the place where he has decided to make a home. Um, he also talks a lot about philosophy, literature, writing, music, history, faith, war, um, the history of slavery uh, pops up in ways where he's kind of reflecting, you know, in deeply personal ways about, about how simply who he is informs the way that the world sees him. And um, one of the things he says at one point, um, which felt like 
like something that if you're listening today at all, um, you'll have heard something similar from others. Um, he says, uh, for I feel responsible for every one of them who was ever born, for every man in the world who is black, because whenever he does something in the world, good or bad, I am blamed for it. Um, and yet it's very much a travel lit book. He has these wonderful chapters describing the topography of Switzerland and, you know, the farmers and the generations of people who have lived there and the things that they love and the things that give them, you know, uh, joy and life. And, you know, he's constantly having to explain why he wants to be there in the first place, which means he has to really love where he is, um, despite the conflict of, of standing out the way he does. Um, really, really a beautiful book um, as well. All my books are beautiful, apparently. Um, <laughs> but also very thoughtful, um, kind of the literature of the flaneur. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, really fantastic. Uh, kind of a lost classic of Black literature and American literature. Um, yeah. So The Burn Book by Vincent O. Carter. Um, also lighter, uh, um, another lighter one is Love Her Madly by Bill Cosgrave. Um, in 1965, a college age Bill was smuggled over the border from Canada, made his way to Los Angeles to meet up with his friend, Mary, um, who uh, was living there and now trying to make a life for herself in LA in the 1960s. And Mary introduces him to her boyfriend, um, this guy named Jim, you know, Jim Morrison. Nobody knew who he was. And Bill and Jim became friends. And so for this time he spent in LA, he just sort of, you know, palled around with Jim. They got high on the beach, they went to parties, they crashed an Academy Awards uh, ceremony, um, they partied in Compton. Like, there's so much stuff in here. This is like a, um, a much lighter, brighter, just kids um, set in Southern California. Um, really evocative, um, accurate, really like really accurate descriptions of place. There's there's never a doubt um, that that Southern California has imprinted itself firmly in his in his brain. And I say that as an ex Californian, um, but just delightful for any of you who like music um, memoirs. That'd be a good one. Um, for those of you who are into young adults, um, the Girl of Hawthorne and Glass. Uh, this came out in the fall as well. Um, it's about a girl who is uh, half um, half witch, basically, and a half human. Um, and she's a ghost assassin. And at the very start of the book, one of her assignments goes horribly, horribly wrong. And rather than release a ghost from a human body, she ends up leaving a person dying on a bathroom floor. And she returns home to try to figure out what's going on. And the coven um, that she works for and that raised her and created her say basically, Hmm, sorry, like, here's your next mission, bye. And they don't explain to her what happened. And so she begins to question everything that they have kind of put out there that she thought she knew. Um, and then she meets uh, a queer kid and then meets his roommate friend, who's just a really sweet kid who believes in like justice and, and all of this stuff. And those two have um, kind of their own mission to go to the witch's coven and to the witch's world. And she wants to learn who her mom is. And so there's all this like trading of, you know, hey, I'll help you if you help me. And then they become friends. And this is a mix of just nature writing, really rich, rich descriptions of the natural world mixed in with sort of this tense um, kind of heisty journey uh, that these three kids are going to be making together. And as they learn about each other and become closer and there's subtle explorations of, of trauma and um, kind of finding your own true identity, but it's also super adventurous, um, really great world building. And there's a sequel coming out in May called The Boy of Feather and Steel. Um, also available on audio on Libro FM. Um, curiosities. Um, if you have like a nine to 12 year old, this is a fun little book that's just about like some kids who get this house. Um, they, they kind of inherit it. And as they explore it and learn about all the quirky things that their family uh, loved and was like their aunt who married a wolf man, um, they eventually meet uh, this huge scary monster kind of at the very end of the book who's been hinted at throughout and um, you know he's like ah I'm gonna eat you I'm gonna eat you up and they're like well why would you do that because you'll be all alone if you do that and you just said you don't want to be alone anymore and he says oh that's that's a really good point point." Um, and the the kids say all right well we have an idea and so they go 
to their lawyer. And there's the great beast with his reading glasses on, uh, sitting with the kids. And they turn the house into a museum so that the great beast can have friends all the time. It's just a fun, 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 fun book. So for those kids who are like a middle grade graphic novels, you know, they're into that kind of stuff, a uh, little above early reader, but they still appreciate lots of great art. This would be a fun one. So curiosities. Um, also for kids, A Good Day for Ducks. This is just a really, really charming, sweet uh, board book, watercolor and ink illustrations about two kids who go out on a spring day and just play. They just play outside in the mud and in the puddles and with the storm and then what happens, you know, going home and having to, you know, dry up and eat dinner and do all those things. And it's just very, very charming, charming, sweet little story. Um, a couple of stores that I have uh, that have brought this in just can't keep it in stock. Um, so if you need something for one of those little ones on a rainy day. Um, and then um, there is a book that I have listed that I thought I had a copy of that's a pop-up book called The Easter Unicorn. So if you are on the book page and you see a listing for a book called The Easter Unicorn, it's a, a really colorful pop-up book about um, a unicorn who has to save Easter when the Easter Bunny has not yet returned from vacation. It is a surprisingly delightful uh, little book. Um, so also in the board book vein, um, there's this wonderful series that um, used to be popular a long time ago and has found its way back into print. Um, these are $6.95 each and they're called Simply Small. See how colorful they are? And they're very small. They're so cute. And each one is a really sweet little story about an animal and something they have to overcome, whether it's looking for a home or um, being a little bit slower than everybody else or being afraid of the dark, um, just really, really sweet. And the language is, is fun to read aloud. Um, you know, it's uh, simple, um, sweet stories. You know, it's just the illustrations are very, very simple. Really good read aloud, delightful, fun, 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 fun little books. I'm just so charmed by these. I mean, Spooky is about a bat that's afraid of the dark and ends up becoming friends with an owl. It's so cute. Anyway. So there's a whole series here for you to check out. Um, and last but not least is a book that um, I said at the beginning that I don't have books that end up on the New York Times bestseller list, except this one. Um, I'm sure all of you will recognize these four people. Anyone know who they are? Yeah. If you don't, I can't help you. <laughs> um, uh, so this guy, Peter Jackson, speaking of Tolkien, who made this movie, you know, a bunch of them about Tolkien's work. And I think you guys know who Peter Jackson is. Um, he has been working for years on a documentary about the Beatles called Get Back. Um, and it's coming out uh, at the end of August. Um, it'll be, um, it's a Disney partnership documentary and he has taken hundreds of hours of previously unseen video and unheard audio tapes that were unearthed in the Beatles archives at Apple Corp. And, um, and he's rewritten the entire last story, the last year of the Beatles, like their entire story is being rewritten by the discoveries he made. Um, there are trailers uh, online that you can check out for it. And everybody I know who's a Beatles fan has been so charmed. I had a friend yesterday say she just saw the excerpts and that she cried with happiness because she was so excited. Um, this is, uh, so even the surviving Beatles so far who have, have um, seen little snippets of it have talked about how how happy they were with what Peter Jackson was doing because they had bought into this narrative that they had spent their own last year um, creating the, the Let It Be album, um, kind of culminating in that, you know, historic rooftop concert um, in 1969, um, that they had believed um, that they had fought all the time and that they hated each other and that they were, you know, there was all this animosity. And, um, and they said, you know, Peter has made it clear that that wasn't the case, that there was so much joy and so much happiness and um, camaraderie and closeness between them. And especially in that last year, um, that this is, this is essentially a renewed story. Um, there's going to be hundreds of photos in this book um, that people have never seen before. Um, there's going to be, you know, their own words. 240 pages it'll be a big huge hardcover uh and 
yeah, um, if you are a fan of the Beatles <laughs> and you would like to read things you've never read before um, from them and see images you've never seen before, um, I highly recommend uh, putting in a pre-order for the Beatles Get Back. Uh, and, you know, maybe, maybe go check out the documentary too, but mostly I'm just here to talk about the book. Anyway, that's it. That's all I got. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Stacey. And also thank you to Katie and Carl. Um, this has been an amazing night. I know my stacks next to my bed have grown uh, in several orders of magnitude. So uh, I think we all have some exciting, great reading coming up. Um, audience members, we've put the link to the blog post in the chat a few times. You can find all of the titles discussed tonight there on our website for easy remembering and browsing and shopping. Um, you can also always email um, myself and Davith at events at northshire.com and we can help uh, jog your memory if you forget something. Um, and thank you all so very much for being with us this evening. Yes, thank you all so much and have a great evening. Um, Katie, Carl, Stacy, this has been great. Um, one quick note, the Beatles Get Back is not on our website yet. Um, it is a little bit too early to pre-order, but um, it will be very soon. All right, have a good night, guys. Thanks so much. Bye.